Hello, everyone. Hi, um, my name is Maddie. Um, I'm the managing editor at The Crimson. Um, thank you guys all for coming. Um, but I'm just going to be introducing our keynote speaker, um, Jill Abramson, um, who, as everyone knows, is former executive editor of The New York Times, um, who started kind of her writing career here at Harvard. Um, she graduated in 1976, and before that, um, she was the editor, arts editor of the Harvard Independent, which is a weekly uh, newspaper here um, that was founded in the late 60s, I believe. Um, and then she also was a stringer for Time Magazine while she was a student. Um, and then kind of the rest of her career, she spent kind of a variety of places as a reporter at the Wall Street Journal for a long time, published books. Um, and of course, was at the Times as both their first female um, Washington bureau chief, uh, managing editor, and executive editor. Um, and now she's back at Harvard um, for the year and for next year teaching um, a narrative journalism class to undergrads. Um, so welcome to Julie Abramson. Maddie was one of my very best students in the fall. Uh, she's too modest to say that, but I have to. So, hi there, uh, college editors and journalists. And for me, I hope future sources. Uh, it's fantastic to be um, the, the keynote speaker at this event. Uh, I um, spoke here probably, I think, we figured out 12 years ago when the Georges uh, first had endowed this very exciting weekend for all of you to cross-fertilize both your passion for journalism and your ideas for how to bring the very highest standards to college campus publications of all kinds. Uh, Chris George is their um, fantastic son, was my colleague at the Wall Street Journal for a number of years in their Washington bureau. And besides being a fantastic journalist, and Anne-Marie told you exactly the kind of journalism that was Chris's sweet spot. Uh, he liked to go out in the country, leave Washington, even though he was like a fantastic government reporter and a whiz at understanding the most complex kind of government policies. But his idea of real journalism was taking that knowledge and going out in the country and reporting about the impact of government policy on real people. And he found the most moving and emblematic kind of American characters in the pieces he wrote. He was also the most delightful kind of colleague to work with. And all of you who spend a lot of time in newsrooms know they're full of cantankerous, <laughs> difficult, manic depressive people. <laughs> but Chris was just uh, this very calm, winsome personality. And he was on the small side, but he was a fantastic athlete and was the star, the secret star of the Wall Street Journal softball team, <laughs> uh, and saved many a season. So I'm like incredibly honored to speak in his memory and to thank the Georges family for their huge generosity to Harvard and their belief in the future of journalism. Uh, and to thank Anne-Marie Lipinski, who has been a fantastic steward uh, of the Neiman program. Uh, when I was an undergraduate here at Harvard, uh, a formative experience for me is to earn extra money. I actually babysat for one of the <laughs> Neiman Fellows regularly. And soaking up, it was in a presidential election year, his experiences, his observations about politics, his passion for journalism, that had definitely an influential role in making me decide to do this as a profession. And uh, the, the fellows this year are fantastic. Uh, 
and she did, it's out in a pile uh, as you leave. She did an amazing, Anne-Marie Shepard did an amazing study that the Neiman Reports did of gender in America's newsrooms. It's not a pretty or uplifting picture necessarily, but it's a very real uh, look at uh, the fact that our newsrooms need to do more on the diversity front. But what I mainly wanted to talk to all of you about is why I'm an incredible optimist about journalism right now. Uh, you know, it's maybe an odd thing to say because we're, you know, one week out from the devastating report on the lapses at Rolling Stone, which showed such a troubling uh, lapse of standards in our profession. And of course, you know, we read, uh, you know, every week about the business model of journalism facing such tough cha challenges. But I think this is like the great heyday of quality reporting and quality journalism. Uh, and I think my full realization of that has come by being back at Harvard where I've been able to step back from being on the front lines of being an editor and really kind of take a broad look at the work that's being done, we focus in my class on long form uh, pieces. And it isn't only through teaching that I have a huge commitment to long form quality journalism, but I'm also involved in a startup that some of you may have read about with, that I am involved in with an old boss of mine, Steve Brill, who I first encountered when I was still in my 20s, and he was founding the American Lawyer magazine at that point, and I went to work there early in my career after Harvard, and I uh, reconnected with him because he endowed the jur journalism initiative at Yale, which is a fantastic program, and he taught the fall term of a uh, quality journalism uh, writing course. And I taught his spring term for five years when I was managing editor of the Times. And he is a fantastic journalist, uh, the winner most recently of the National Magazine Award for a very long explore, exploration of healthcare costs that he wrote in Time Magazine and Time actually devoted the entire well of its magazine to his piece, uh, something that's rarely done. Uh, most famously, it was done at the New Yorker magazine when John Hersey's Hiroshima was published, you know, one of the landmark works of nonfiction narrative. Uh, but Time did it for Steve, and he turned that work into a book. But Steve's big aha from that experience was his belief that there's a space in the reporting and writing sphere for something that's actually longer than a, ma a regular magazine piece, even you know your average New Yorker piece. And you should think of as being the uh, nonfiction equivalent of the novella. Um, and so probably between 20 and 30,000 words, and we intend to publish, to devote ourselves. We're not building a big newsroom. You know, it's two veteran editors who are going to seek out the best long stories there are, the whale of a tale that you aren't reading in lots of other places. Uh, so keep that in mind as uh, you incubate your great ideas. We're um, about, I, one thing about startups that I've learned in the, the past year is that starting up takes a long time. <laughs> and, uh, but I think that we will soon be announcing like who our partner and publishing platform and 
funding partner is. So stay tuned for that. So I'm very, besides teaching here at Harvard, very excited about that. I'm also, why I refer to you as future sources, I'm writing a book, I've decided to write a book about uh, this transitional moment that we find ourselves in journalism where, you know, some of the highest quality traditional journalism outfits, you know, like the Times, the Washington Post, the broadcast networks, the, you know, best magazines, the New Yorker and Time that have been around for at least my whole life that, you know, I think there's something very dramatic and, and noble in their struggle to remain uh, committed to quality journalism, to continue publishing, and to make it through this transition to digital. Uh, and on the other side are the newcomers like BuzzFeed and Vice and Facebook, I was just uh, talking to my table mate, Anna, who is head, um, the lead editor at the Princetonian at Princeton. And, you know, she was explaining to me that Facebook and its newsfeed are actually for many Princeton students, you know, the main publisher and platform for how they see news. They, they don't have the time to go to the Times' website all the time, or the Washington Post, or CNN. And they're mainly, you know, reading um, links sent to them by trusted friends. And that's becoming a very dynamic, powerful force in, in the, the news industry. And some of you probably read recently that the New York Times and BuzzFeed are both potentially going to like offer their content and let Facebook publish it directly because it may be a better user experience for people who are mainly getting their news on mobile phones, which is increasingly a huge part of the New York Times' audience. Uh, you know, smartphones are becoming the way everybody lives. And, that makes for both a challenging time, but a great time. So, you know, back, back to, to long form for a minute. I feel I have to support my optimism to, to you. And so I'm going to begin with, you know, some of the traditional media companies. And, you know, I don't think I have to convince you that the New York Times is still doing the best work ever. I, would point to you if you missed it the first time around when Science Times at the end of the year devoted its whole issue to a study of, you know, the Ebola uh, conflagration and the failures at multiple levels to prevent it from getting out of control. It was a very rich multimedia presentation uh, deeply reported by a team of journalists who went all over West Africa, who held the CDC in Atlanta accountable. It's just like I'm really rooting for it for a Pulitzer. We'll find out who won those pretty soon. But, you know, the be I think, you know, the best possible long, ambitious, uh, well-reported on the ground stories are being done by the Times, the Post very much advantaging itself from the fact that it has a new wealthy owner is like totally back at the top of its form. Uh, Marty Barron, I think, is having a great ride as editor there. Uh, and, you know, I, I fell in love with journalism uh, besides my meme and babysitting, but, you know, during my freshman year was when the Watergate scandal, like, reached its apex, and I would have to walk to Harvard Square, literally, to buy the print edition of the Washington Post that was three days old, because I wanted to read Woodward and Bernstein's, like, news stories. But, 
you know, back in the 70s, that's what you had to do if you wanted to see that kind of quality journalism. But, you know, that definitely had something to do with why I became a journalist, too. But the Post is doing great work. I mean, the, the traditional companies are, you know, doing great. Yes, we still read about newsroom cuts, but it's nothing like, in, you know, before you were even paying attention to what was going on in journalism, like right after the financial crisis in 2008, you had, you know, news organizations completely ripping up their newsrooms, like making deep, very tragic cuts to the point where, you know, there were some, re you know, formerly quality regional newspapers that weren't even covering the state houses and some of the states. Uh, that they covered, but slowly but surely, like within those ashes rose, you know, all digital uh, news organizations like you Texans, the Texas Tribune is fantastic, Min Post uh, in Minnesota is great, uh, you know, that has helped uh, bring quality journalism back. Uh, so. You know, the New Yorker is at the top of its game. Uh, you know, even, you know, the broadcast networks and, you know, CNN are doing some interesting things. NPR is fabulous. So I think, you know, it's a, a while all of the business model problems have not been worked out, it's a, a pretty, I think the, the newsrooms of traditional news organizations are mainly fairly optimistic places. So that's one reason to be optimistic. Uh, and so that leads me to the, the new players. And, you know, it may shock you, but, you know, I think that um, some of the new players like BuzzFeed and Vice are doing fabulous quality long form pieces. Uh, uh, editor named Mark Schufs, who won a Pulitzer himself and was at ProPublica for a while, is the investigative editor at BuzzFeed. He has 11 full-time investigative reporters working for him. I mean, that's almost as many full-time investigative reporters as I had in the newsroom of the New York Times. And they're doing significant work. And a lot of the reporters who are doing the investigative stories at BuzzFeed are young. I mean, not much older than you are. BuzzFeed's audience obviously skews young, too. Uh, but, you know, I, I met with a, a young reporter there who had been recruited from the Indianapolis Star, where he's in his 20s. He had been on a Pulitzer team there, and he did the most inventive, original, deep reporting on a subject I had never seen explored anywhere about um, battered women who were involved in abuse cases where their children were either killed or badly hurt. And because of strange laws in about 30 states called failure to protect laws, uh, the women uh, were actually getting much longer jail sentences than the male abusers uh, who had, you know, hurt both them or their children. Uh, some of these women had jail terms of like 30 years. And uh, it was a great investigation. Uh, and I know they have some investigative finalists for some of the most prestigious journalism awards uh, and you know vice you know in it's eight and at 11 you know their weekly show that's a co-production with hbo goes on and they really have sort of reinvented the 60 minutes <coughs> news magazine and they go deep they do stories um mainly international stories with young correspondents in places that the traditional broadcast networks don't often go. And some of the, the, the long stories that they're doing on that show are great. Last Friday, there was one um, 
that uh, a, a young female correspondent named Gianna Tamboni did about the surrogacy business in India, about basically rent a womb <laughs> among poor women in India, where she went and interviewed the women. She exposed like heinous business practices there. She went undercover. It was like the bravest kind of journalism. And, you know, this is in newsrooms where you just have to get used to the fact that at BuzzFeed, you're going to see a investigative story right next to, uh, you know, a, a silly LOL listicle. Uh, you know, it's going to coexist with the adorable puppies or, you know, any manner of things. And, you know, Vice is a newsroom where Shane Smith, its top editor, actually walked around the newsroom naked to celebrate um, the two millionth YouTube subscriber that they got. So, you know, it's a definitely a different culture, but, you know, I'm saying hats off. They're doing, like, important work. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I cite them not because they're singular examples. I think, you know, they're, there's great long stuff. Uh, being done in many places. I almost fell over, you know, fell off my bed two weeks ago. I was, you know, just sit, lying down emailing with friends, and I emailed Jeff Gerth, who is like a very famous investigative reporter from the New York Times, who worked for me when I was Washington Bureau Chief, is a great friend of mine. He left the Times, went to ProPublica, where he works now. And I, I just emailed him and I said, have you done you know, any interesting pieces lately? I haven't seen anything by you. And he, he sent me a link. And I thought, my eyes deceived me, Jeff Gerth and Gawker. <laughs> But, you know, the piece was great. It was like a very long, ambitious piece that tangentially involved Hillary Clinton's emails. But it wasn't like a scandal piece. It was, you know, it was really, it was a, an interesting, long, challenging piece. And I think uh, I just read that Gawker recently hired a very, seasoned, older national security reporter whose work I know and admire very much. So, you know, great long form journalism is being done in some unexpected places. And that is, I think, fantastic news for all of us and very much, you know, lives up to the legacy of Chris, who more than anything else stood for going out and reporting the hell out of a story. And that's what you have to do for long form narrative. Uh, there's no skimping on the reporting, uh, Rolling Stone be damned. <laughs> uh, there just is no substitute for that. Uh, I guess, you know, I, I need to offer a few cautionary notes to my optimism. Uh, you know, I think that uh, aggregation, while, you know, all of us probably have our favorite aggregators, what I worry about is, you know, when someone else's uh, link to a story is at the top of Google and they haven't paid a thin dime to support the actual work, that bothers me a lot. And, you know, I think I read somewhere this week that, you know, Larry Wright's New Yorker piece on Scientology, which was the basis for the HBO documentary Going Clear, which is really good journalism if you have time to see it. That when the New Yorker published that, like the 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 first search that popped up was actually the Huffington Post, which happens a lot. And of course, God only knows how much, you know, David Remnick 
spent to have Larry investigate Scientology, plus, you know, all of the risks that Larry himself had to take to actually report that story. I just, I worry about, you know, aggregation, undercutting the quality of, of the work. And, and and hurting the overall landscape. Uh, I also worry about disaggregation a bit. You know, it allows people to only read deeply about a limited number of subjects or to read news that is only from a viewpoint that they agree with. So that, that worries me some. Um, I worry a lot about censorship. Uh, you know, I had the, the luxury of spending 17 years at the New York Times, which never hesitated to stand up to censorship. And one of my absolute proudest moments at the Times was when we published David Barboza's piece about the corruption of the ruling elite leadership families in China. And the Times' website was shut down within hours and remains completely shut in China. But And that was at a point where the Times was trying to establish a Mandarin language website that had been doing very good that was also shut down. But, the Times did not flinch in reporting that. And I, I worry that that kind of tradition and culture doesn't permeate enough the rest of the press. And I was distressed in the past week to read about how quickly various, uh, especially big social media sites, you know, sort of relented to Turkey's demand that certain images of a politician who had been killed there be taken down, not because they were graphic, but for political reasons. And, you know, I think that, that, that it's just uh, very important that um, we stand up to censorship internationally and then here in our country I've been very outspoken about the Obama administration's eight criminal leak investigations and the use of a obscure 1917 espionage act to prosecute whistleblowers and as part of those prosecutions to sweep in journalists to subpoena them and try to compel their testimony. I was very happy that James Risen, who had worked with me at the, the Times, that he did not end up being compelled or forced to go to jail. But I know if he had been faced with the choice of having to reveal anything about who his confidential whistleblower source was, that he would have gone to jail rather than do that. So that is also something to worry about, uh, but want to end on a note of optimism and, you know, one of the many thrills of being back at Harvard and part of this community is that journalism is actually being reinvented right here. And uh, in the fall, I went and visited a group of recent graduates who are designing a new news app uh, that actually uh, tracks um, news stories and what's trending on social media, ranks the news <coughs> according to what, um, what, what stories are uh, going viral on social media. It has a very catchy name. It's called Brief Me, and I'm going to confess to you, I've become addicted to it. <laughs> uh, again, it's kind of the opposite of the long form uh, quality original reporting that I'm most passionate about, but it's a smart app. Apple um, has picked it as one of the best apps in their 
most recent recommendations and uh, invented here at Harvard at the Innovation Lab at the Business School. So what next? I don't know. I look to all of you are going to be the inventors of what next. And, you know, I have utmost trust uh, and faith in all of you that you're going to hold the highest standards as you go forward into the profession and uh, I wish you all the luck in the world and hope that when you're out reporting and finding the people to illustrate your stories that you have as much empathy and passion as Chris George, my friend, did. So thanks a lot. I may turn to you, Anne Marie, for the answer so you can help the answer woman tonight. So, remember what we said? You have questions. Ask questions. And tell me where you're from, if you would. Uh, Michael from the Columbia Daily Spectator. Uh, so, you mentioned that you didn't necessarily. Michael, where's my hat? We mean the two. Your Harvard hat? Yes. No? No. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that you didn't necessarily mind having fun cat listicles next to hard news at BuzzFeed. Does your opinion differ for, say, native advertising next yeah. to really quality journalism? Actually, um, in, in my cautionary notes, uh, I skipped over native advertising. But, like, what... On the BuzzFeed site itself, I mean, BuzzFeed only has native advertising. That is its business model. And I think they're, you know, I know exactly where the native ad always is on their site. I actually don't think they're trying to confuse the reader. Like, it, at the times, they're called paid posts. I forget what the... the you know, identifier is. I think native advertising worries me a lot if it truly confuses the reader, number one. Uh, and I think on some sites it does. Uh, and the line between what is news and information created by journalists is very blurry with the ads. Uh, BuzzFeed's model, you know, the ads on purpose mimic the listicles. Uh, they, just to give you an example, although I probably don't need to, you probably all like know BuzzFeed, but, you know, a, a paid post they had the other day was um, from International House of Pancakes, and it was just like the 25 ways the world would be better if we all ate more pancakes. And I, you know, being a pancake eater, I, of course, opened it. And, you know, it was like a listicle that was animated and it had like pancakes falling from the sky and all kinds of silly things that was like just like, you know, the other, other content. But it is identified. Uh, what I worry about, Michael, is that at some shops, and you should ask about this, I think, you know, in terms of if you're going to work at new media organizations, sometimes they, some of these places have the journalists, the news gatherers, actually also writing the native ads. And I think that in, a, in and of itself could confuse readers. And I, I worry about that. So the potential for confusion is absolutely there and does worry me. And I, you know, was a worrier about native advertising when I was at the Times, but I haven't seen anything on the Times site that I think isn't clearly an ad so far. Yeah. Um, I'm from the University of Oregon. 
Um, we just started. Are you sleeping? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm I'm a little bit um, tired, but it's exciting to be here. Um, we just started a podcast a division within um, the Oregon Daily Emerald, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on the future of public radio and audio storytelling. Are you a fan of mm -hmm. serial at all? I was like such a serial addict, and I addicted everybody in my family. And uh, when Sarah Koenig at episode five or whatever it was, did her one plea for donations, I like definitely shelled out because I felt like it had <laughs> given my family alone so much entertainment I needed to support it. I think, again, I'm a total optimist. And, it's, and I just think everything has its moment. And I think now is a great time for public radio and a great time for podcasting, which, you know, years ago, I remember we started a podcasting division at the Times that, like, didn't pan out. But I think, you know, now we're in an, uh, in an on-demand world, and people don't necessarily want appointment listening or appointment viewing. They want to be able to listen to something when they want. And podcasting, you know, is just perfect for that. Uh, and, you know, I often will just queue up uh, This American Life when I go to the gym or, you know, anything when you're in the car. But, you know, I think what I worry about with cereal is that everyone is going to try to mimic it. And, you know, what I loved about it, obviously, it's long form, you know, in such a vivid way. It was 12, you know, one-hour episodes. Uh, but, you know, not every story can sustain that length. That one did. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, it, it was the most old-fashioned kind of, of story that kept you on the edge of your seat and, you know, was a new media version of one of the oldest uh, traditions that uh, some of you as literature scholars will recognize. It's, you know, the way Dickens published. Uh, his novels were serialized and... You know, there were people waiting on the docks in London, you know, for the latest chapters of the old curiosity shop because they wanted to know, you know, is Little Nell going to be all right? And uh, it's kind of the, the, it's a human want, you know, the, the, the appetite for this kind of journalism, it's a human drive to like hear a fantastic story that has huge narrative power and narrative tension and in my class we study closely the masters who are able to create that in journalism but that really was what serial was uh i can't wait for it to see what she does with her second season uh I heard her uh, speak a week ago, uh, two weeks ago, I guess, at a conference at BU that I spoke at on narrative journalism. And I really expected as she came onto the stage that music to be playing. <laughs> but it doesn't play when Sarah appears. <laughs> Um, and I was curious, like, what are some of your favorite outlets of new journalism or alternative stories that we haven't necessarily seen done in the past? Maybe things like box cards or interactive maps to tell a story. I love interactive graphics. Uh, like, totally, I can lose myself in um, uh, in all kinds of dangerous ways. Uh, I really, I, I think this is going to again sound contradictory because I've been focused on long form journalism, but I actually think Instagram has become like a great like storytelling vehicle and that, you know, scrolling through the work of photojournal, photojournalists who 
post on Instagram and now even use it to form a very visual narrative, that that's like totally exciting and interesting. So. Hi, um, I'm Jen. I'm from the Michigan Daily at the University of Michigan. I was just in your territory. Oh, really? This is sweet. Yeah. Oh, really? I was at the Night Wallace oh, Fellows. Yeah, it's a great program they have. They're really but great. not as great as the New Um I was wondering if you could, what kind of advice you have for women um, in the newsroom, specifically in leadership positions. Um, you're navigating those, especially as you spoke to kind of the issues with gender across um, journalism and those platforms today. Yeah, my advice is go for it. Uh, and don't have like a voice inside your head second guessing every aspect of your style all the time. That, you know, I have said on numerous occasions in public that I do think as, you know, the top editor of an important publication that women face a double standard in the way that they are judged and that qualities that are seen as leadership qualities in men are judged to be shrill or abrupt or, you know, you can name numerous adjectives uh, that were used to describe me. But you just have to be your authentic self. And if you're a fantastic journalist with good judgment, who has an ability to work with other people and inspire their best story ideas and their best journalism, you just, like, can't let any of that stop you. And I worry that all of the attention that was paid to me being fired last May sort of has overwhelmed the fact that, you know, I've had, like, the best career in journalism and still have lots that I'm going to be doing. And... Uh, you know, we, we are, humans are very resilient. And a dirty little secret for most of you is that most of you are going to be fired at one point <laughs> in your careers. I hate to tell you that, but it can turn out to be a good thing and make you either go back to passions that you didn't have time to really enjoy uh, in whatever you were most recently doing. I mean, I have found, like, I'm just having such a blast, like, reporting and writing again. And, you know, on certain days, I wonder, why did I ever, like, become an editor? Let someone <laughs> convince me that. But I, you know, I don't regret being an editor either. But I, I worry about, you know, women just getting overly twisted up in knots over, am I being to this or to that? You, you just need to follow a uh, you know, true journalistic compass and do good work. And I think you know, most of the time, that's enough. Uh, I, you know, just, I don't want to seem to you like completely like lacking in self-criticism. And I think something that I've thought about is that early in my career when I was a reporter and, you know, journalism was more male-dominated then than it is even now, but that I sometimes felt in news meetings that I wasn't heard, you know, that somehow what I said was it was like no one heard it. And then a male colleague might make the same point and people would say, oh, Jerry just made like the most brilliant point. And I'd be like, you know, <laughs> and that, but I worry that that feeling like later in my career when I did have, you know, the most influential 
jobs at the time that I like still somehow felt like I had to fight to be heard and that that resulted in me maybe not listening enough. And so that would just be another aspect of gender that I would leave with you. But I think journalism is a fantastic career for women and I would encourage anyone who wanted to lead a newsroom to try to do that. Uh, I had a great, a great time and a great run doing it. Hey, um, I'm Meg. I'm with the Crimson here. Um, and you're just mentioning Instagram and um, something big, obviously, right now is Twitter as well. Um, and I'm sort of wondering uh, what you think the balance should be or is between individual <coughs> writers sort of creating their own brands via these, you know, different outlets. Um, but also making sure that they're maintaining some sort of continuity with the overall vision of their outlet. I think, you know, that that branding of individual journalists is in inevitable and important in a time when social media is so dominant. Uh, it's a way to get a following for your work, and I think that's fine. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking like of the the best examples of people who were, you know, who burn up Twitter and still somehow, you know, also exude the values of the institution that they work for. And I'm thinking of, you know, David Carr, who was like my pal at the times and I loved him and he was like a very valuable wise head to me like through all my years as managing editor and then executive editor but he is I think a fabulous example of someone who was completely branded and known as David Carr but he always sort of tried to use that prominence to reinforce the values and importance of the times. And I think that's the best kind of coexistence. Uh, but, you know, to be a brand and last as a brand, you have to do quality work. It has to be the real deal. Being, you know, just getting your name out there for the sake of being a brand is kind of worthless in the end. So I'm um, for branding when it's branding some fabulous piece of journalism. Yeah, cool. okay. <laughs> My name is Emma, I'm from Brown. And we actually, earlier, before you started speaking, we were talking at this table about how we've taken journalism courses, we've produced work through student publications, um, and how there's kind of this gap in what we're being taught about investigative reporting and writing and how we don't have the ability to then put that on the internet. We don't have the skills to make infographics. We don't have the skills to put together videos to put online or photojournalism skills. And we were talking about how, you know, we have a program at Brown where you can create your own courses. And we were talking about what professors we should go to. Should journalists now in college, should we be taking computer science classes or taking classes with our media departments in addition to our writing courses? And kind of like how, how big of a leg up will that give us going into journalism past college? No, I, I think acquiring all the skills you can in college, but not to the point where, for instance, you're not reading Shakespeare. I'm not going to tell you, like, learn, you know, programming, you know, unless that you want to be a technologist. But, you know, it, it's an advantage. And I think a, an interesting, I wish I had more granular sort of job seeking advice to connect it with. But I think it is valuable to learn and have teachers who can teach you those skills. I just at Harvard, I'm dying to teach, you know, a multimedia narrative course here. And harnessing the resources to do that is a little bit 
tough. Um, you know, luckily beginning to find out like where those resources reside and how to harness some. It's my first year here, but I, I would love to get like, I think the, the, the thing that, that is difficult to merge it with teaching is to do that kind of work and to pull off a great multimedia project, which is sort of what you're asking about. You need to work in teams, and in a modern newsroom, the best journalism is being created by teams, and it isn't just, you know, the word reporters or the photojournalists. It's now often, like, an, you know, an engineer who's figuring out, like, a new interface that can be used for publishing the piece. I mean, Snowfall, which some of you may have read the times published a couple of years ago was like a great multimedia piece of journalism had an entirely uh, new interface for that very clean very beautiful but that was i think i counted up all told there were 17 journalists working on that including technologists so i think i would encourage all of you to the degree like your your publications have the resources to get used to working in a group because journalism isn't the rugged individual sport that it was for most of my career anymore. It's like working in teams is the new way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Matt. I'm from the Crimson. Um, I apologize that this has already been asked because I missed the first question, but. Uh, you talked about Rolling Stone, and I'm wondering how you manage your investigative teams, given that uh, investigative reporters have to have relationships and have sources that might be difficult to access, or certainly more difficult than, than a traditional source. Um, and I think we saw that in the Columbia Journalism Report. So how did you manage those situations uh, at the Times or, or elsewhere? I just was, you know, any time you are basically basing an entire long article on someone whose real name, you know, or just a first name or a pseudonym is being used. The bar for corroboration is just immensely high. And that was, I think, the main problem with Rolling Stone is it was kind of a one source story. I actually assigned the story, warts and all, to my spring class. Uh, we read uh, the Rolling Stone piece alongside of Walt Bogdanich's like, excellent pieces about campus rapes in the New York Times. And the differences like, were beyond obvious to my students that in the cases that Walt was writing about, he had you know, documentary evidence. He got hold of like, the disciplinary hearing, the transcript in one of the cases he wrote about. Uh, you, you know, the idea that this was all according the Rolling Stone piece to Jackie, that you know, none of the other people whose pseudonyms were given as her friends were contacted, and that, you know, the guy involved, uh, you know, the, the fact that the editors didn't know who he was, I think all of that is just like, you know, the shocking lapse that Steve Call said it was in that report. Uh, and, you know, it's just a comparison. It was a, a story involving different issues, but Jane Mayer of The New Yorker and I spent three years doing an investigative book about the Clarence Thomas, Anita Hill case, which is probably beyond ancient history <laughs> to most of you. But, you know, in, in for the reporting for our book, I mean, we made sure that like every allegation that Anita Hill made was corroborated. We interviewed the corroborators of the corroborators. I mean, you have to be meticulous and, uh, and not go into a, a, an investigative story with such a strong assumption of guilt or where it leads that your mind is closed to something taking a surprising turn. I think that 
is vital and that that was lacking in Rolling Stone. I think early the reporter was so convinced that she had found the platonic ideal case of a campus rape that blew open the terrible culture on campus and all of that, that, you know, no one stopped to say, like, well, what if it isn't? And you have to do that with almost every kind of investigative story. I mean, it troubles me beyond Rolling Stone that so many investigative stories like flow from prosecution leaks, because I think that can lead you down a, a, a wrong hole too, although that was not a factor in this. But I've had, had a couple of bruising experiences of that kind as an editor at the Times, where we just did not, we like went, we bought in too early and too quickly to a prosecution narrative, and that there was sort of plenty of reporting to support that narrative, but there's also narrative weighing in the, there's also evidence weighing in the other direction that we didn't like hear or bother to get at, and that can, Bite you in the you know what. Yeah. Hi, my name is Emily, and I'm from Brown as well. Can you talk a little bit about diversity in newsrooms? It seems just from the newsrooms that I've been in, and also other journalists that I've talked to, that there is not only a lack of you know gender distribution, but there's no. not many people of color. There's not a lot it's, of socioeconomic diversity in newsrooms. And so can you just talk a little bit about that and also how you think newsrooms can deal with that issue? It, great question. Definitely, you know, the lack of gender diversity pales next to the lack of journalists of color in most big newsrooms. Uh, you know, th this may seem like a Pollyanna view, but um, I feel that some of the new media organizations are doing better. It may be a combination of trending younger, and also we now live in a journalistic firmament where everyone it has to be global, and I think that has helped on the diversity front too. Uh, and you know, it's uh, I think uh, all of this is like a pipeline and promotion issue, and that you know the top editors uh, of all news organizations just need to make true diversity uh, priority. I That was very important to me when I was at the Times, and it wasn't just gender diversity. Uh, but you have to be willing to actively seek and promote people of diverse backgrounds to leadership roles. And I wish I could tell you I felt like that was universally cheered. I think it's still can be, uh, you know, upsetting or, you know, it can make some people uncomfortable when you do that. But journalism needs to do better. I mean, all of the professions do, basically. But um, journalism holds itself out as bringing the world to people as it is. And if you have only journalists who are of a certain privileged white background doing that, it's going to be warped and not accurate and not the highest quality. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm from the Wellesley News. And I was curious, um, I think we hear often these days about war correspondents being targeted frequently. Um, and I was curious how the New York Times trained its foreign correspondents mm -hmm. to go into conflict zones, and what you think about these sort of bright-eyed young journalists yeah, these days I, going into... I worry about them. Okay. But um, I'll answer it as specifically as I can first about the Times. The Times has the resources 
that almost every correspondent who's even remotely in a danger zone gets extensive security training by trained professionals. Uh, and that, in the end, isn't enough to protect everyone. I had to live through... Uh, you know, the kidnapping of David Road when I was managing editor, and I was no longer at the Times, but Alyssa Rubin is a very close friend of mine. I had worked with her going back to American Lawyer Days, and, you know, she was hurt very badly in a, a plane crash uh, covering a, a, a story in Iraq, and thank goodness she's in recovery now, but, you know, my heart still aches for, you know, Kathy Gannon of the AP, who's still, like, having many operations and, you know, mourn her pho photojournalist colleague who was killed. I mean, it is treacherous. I mean, in terms of cautionary notes, that maybe should have been my number one, like tar the targeting and killing of journalists. It's uh, out of control. On, in terms of the bright-eyed people who may not work at places like the New York Times, um, I had a great meeting in Brooklyn with a, a new outfit of young editors, they're called story hunters, and what they're trying to do is establish a network of young foreign correspondents uh, where they're going to, you know, sort of create almost a new wire service <clears throat> for this cadre of journalists. And more important than even that, they're going to vet their work and kind of try and be a clearinghouse for especially new media organizations who are looking for correspondence in certain places that may be hot spots. But the thing that's most heartening to me is that they want to give them insurance, which I think is great. So it's going to be a work network, but providing some level of uh, insurance support and maybe some training too. So that gives me a little bit of of hope, but I worry about anyone who is going to think about like going to a war zone or a dangerous place to be a freelancer just because they think there's a market for it and they're going to get work. It's uh, it's it's too dangerous a world for someone to go gallivanting without a lot of training and preparation to any of these places. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Sternlicht um, from the University of Pennsylvania, Daily Pennsylvania and slash 34th Street. Um, and I'm wondering, a lot of your optimism seems to come from long form journalism. And millennials are, of course, notorious for having shorter attention <laughs> spans. So I'm wondering how you can remain optimistic when our generation is so bad at paying attention. <laughs> I, you know, I think if something is long and riveting that it still does attract a young audience. I mean, you know, I'm not going to fight most of the generalizations that, that you make, but, you know, there are exceptions and, you know, that's why, like, it encourages me so much to see BuzzFeed investing in long form. I mean, they're not doing that because they want a good citizenship medal. They're doing it because yet their young audience is actually reading those stories and digging them. So um, I, I just think it coexists. I'm not saying everyone on their smartphone is going to dive into one of the Jill Brill novellas, but some people are going to read it that way, and they're going to hear about one of our great stories and just feel like, I got to read that, and they're going to read it. Okay. Okay. Have fun this weekend. <laughs> uh, and... Uh,
I may be calling you. <laughs>